this is the second part of our video series discussing how an alternate history timeline would go, one where the Soviets somehow managed to get along with the Axis. They joined them and changed the course of World War II forever. Do check out the first part for context and setup. We left off with the Soviets and Germans applying pressure on the British Isles in 1942. More and more submarines harassed the Allied Atlantic routes. Combined Axis air power is immense. And the Germans and Soviets slowly start to build up an invasion fleet. But landing on the British mainland is deemed too risky. With help from the US, the British Air Force still clings on, and control of the air over the British coast is teetering. The Axis can't merge their Mediterranean and Atlantic fleets. The British have even called back some of their Pacific fleet, so they can defend the Atlantic. US ships are plentiful as well there. The Japanese use that to their advantage. As their Chinese campaign is going slowly, they refocus. They even strike at Sri Lanka. Big battles and losses on both sides ensue, but the island remains British. With their new possessions in the Pacific, the Japanese are now spread out. While they do control lots of new islands, they can't exploit their resources right away. At the start of 1943, the situation is as follows. Egypt is German. The Middle East is mostly Soviet. In eastern Algeria, there's a stalemate as Germans and Italians hold against the Western Allies. The Soviets reach towards Pakistan, but the mountainous terrain makes progress very slow and very costly. In this timeline, Soviet forces are much different. Their ground forces are smaller, but more motorized. Their air force is huge and their navy keeps growing, even though they still lack modern capital ships. To construct complex vessels like battleships and big aircraft carriers, a lot of time is needed, even in the middle of the war. And the Soviets lacked experience in shipbuilding, especially when it comes to aircraft carriers. In this alternate timeline, Germany would continue to work on their carriers, but the first carrier would still not be operational until mid-1943. Furthermore, German carrier designs were quite a bit smaller, and Germans lacked experience overall. But the production of naval assets continues. Both the Royal and Soviet navies are constrained by the fact that their fleets are dispersed around the world. Germany had something called Navy Plan Z in the real timeline. Before the war started, they planned to build a big navy by 1947. In this timeline, much of that plan would actually happen. Perhaps all those ships, and even a few more, would be rushed into service by 1945. But comparing those figures with the US and British numbers, even when adding the Soviet ships, it's clear the Axis could not hope to compete with the Allies on the open seas. And while the British can't make as many ships as they did in the actual timeline, the US could. In the real timeline, the US greatly outproduced Japan in the Pacific. Its shipbuilding effort was started even before Pearl Harbor happened. By 1945, in the actual timeline, the US Navy operated the fleet shown on the screen. Japan would have built more ships than in reality, but not many more, as its capacity was pretty much maxed out. In the alternate timeline, newly commissioned carrier numbers remain roughly the same for the US and Japan as they were on this actual timeline list shown. The British ships would likely be at least half the numbers though. Even though most US ships and planes do go to the Atlantic, Japan is not in a good state in the Pacific at the end of 1943. They've already lost some carriers at the Battle of Midway and against the British in the Indian Ocean. Allied planes operating from Australia and Hawaii constantly inflict additional losses. And the technological gap, primarily in electronics, that existed in the real timeline as well, rears its head in the alternate timeline as well. By the end of the year, the US takes back the Midway Islands. The US starts to push westward during 1944, but the progress is very slow, one island at a time. Costly marine landings are not attempted. Japanese on the islands are cut off until they surrender. In the Pacific, most of 1944 is spent just getting to the line where the real timeline front was at the end of 1942. The US progress then stagnates as more and more forces are needed in the Atlantic, and as Japanese supply lines get shorter and easier to defend. 
1944 is also the year both Germany and the Soviet Union managed to get their production effort up to speed, exceeding their highest real timeline production numbers. The thing is, German production in the real timeline was pretty lackluster in organization and decisiveness, until the situation for them became desperate, around 1943. More capable people were then appointed to run it, and the total war economy was implemented. Before that, there were no grave rations like there were in the UK, and a lot of non-crucial industries still used up various resources. Soviet production would suffer a similar issue without that grave threat for the life that forced the Soviets to turn their economy upside down, going all in on warfare production. With somewhat easy successes in the Middle East and no direct threats, the Soviets would likely take more time to get to production levels seen in the real timeline, despite the fact there would be no lost factories. Germany and the Soviet Union would by that point, in late 1944, be realizing a stalemate has occurred over Britain. Their air power would easily defeat any Allied attempt at either bombing continental Europe or supporting a successful amphibious landing. But a lot of their aircraft would still be early war designs, which were short on range. So a good part of the British islands would still be out of capable fighter aircraft range. The US would still be amassing troops, air defenses and planes on the isles. Ground forces would likely be an afterthought, compared to the extra air forces needed. Supplies to the British Isles would be sporadic, due to grave submarine threats that simply would not let up. But submarines can't really control the seas, they are more tools of harassment. It's unlikely the Soviets and Germans would attempt a proper land invasion on Britain soon. D-Day succeeded only because of the massive, massive numerical advantage the Allies had in every possible respect. It's only in 1945 that the Axis might, after several years of building a specialized assault force, try and land on Britain. Air and naval ops require lots of fuel. The Soviets would be doing the heavy lifting there, for everyone, and yet even their production was not comparable to US oil production. But it would surely be bigger than their actual timeline end of war production. Technology-wise, in the real timeline, the Germans were initially ahead in radars, but as the war progressed, they fell behind. Their jet engines were hindered by a lack of resources, which might not apply in the alternate timeline, thus resulting in German jet fighters appearing even a bit earlier. Sharing some technology, the Soviets would benefit as well, though they might take some time to implement new tech. And the Germans would likely hold top-of-the-line stuff for themselves, as that would be their only leverage against the Soviets knowing they control most of German oil influx. The Germans didn't share all their tech with the Japanese either, in the real timeline. Various guided bombs and anti-aircraft missiles would likely start to proliferate even more. Both sides use them in the reality in very small quantities. An advantage in rocketry would have also allowed Germany to produce somewhat better SAM systems. The US was ahead in proximity fuses, testing them a few years ahead of the Germans. The Allies were also ahead in advanced radar tech and ways to jam radars. Picking the low-hanging fruit and lured by the prospect of an entry into the Atlantic, it's possible the Axis would perform a vast joint Soviet-German push across North Africa. With so many commitments elsewhere and an accent on naval and air power, the Allies would not likely prevail. Slowly but surely, by the end of 1944, the US and British forces would be driven out of Algeria and Morocco. Suddenly, Gibraltar would be in shelling range, across the strait. In addition to holding on to the northern route, which itself would be constantly attacked, now a big chunk of the British Navy would suddenly be needed to keep the Gibraltar Strait choked. And with Axis air power relocating to Morocco, even Allied carriers could not afford to sail close anymore. Slowly but surely, in the opening months of 1945, the Axis Mediterranean fleet, this time stronger by a few years worth of Germany-sponsored Italian build-up, would start to trickle into the Atlantic. A few hundred Soviet submarines would also keep increasing the pressure on the northern supply route. If nothing changed, it could be months before Britain would be effectively cut off and invaded. But more about that in our third and final part of this video series coming out in a week or so. On Friday there will be an unrelated video coming out on the historical episode from the 1950s, 
when China almost got nuked. So check that out as well. Oh, and one last thing, a shout out to Call of War, a nifty free to play strategy game where you can try creating your own alternate timelines. There's a link below if you want to try it out. Thanks for watching. If you liked my video, subscribe to my channel. If you want to receive notifications from YouTube about new videos released, you have to click that bell button. If you're using a mobile device, you'll get this prompt. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.